The psalmist reminds us God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, we're going to begin this morning by singing verse, uh, the version of that psalm in number 46b in our blue hymn books. The two versions there of Psalm 46, we're singing the second God is our strength and refuge, our present help in trouble, and we therefore will not fear. Number 46b. as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, how glad we are to bow in your presence on this, the first day of a new year, and to be reminded that it is you and you alone who are the ruler over all the times in which we live. You are the Lord of time and history. You are the Lord of space, the Lord over this world and every world. 
You are the Lord of eternity. You, Lord, have been the dwelling place of your people in all generations. And before the mountains were brought forth, or you had ever formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. What a comfort, O oh Lord, to our often troubled hearts to know that you, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's great powers, that you are our God, our helper, our protector, a very present help, a fortress of protection and peace. Whatever the world may throw at us, whatever our lives may encounter, in this coming year of 2017. How wonderful it is, Lord, to rejoice in you, Emmanuel, God with us, to know that our Lord Jesus Christ has promised ever to be with us, never to leave us, never to forsake us, even unto the end of the age. We praise you, our Father, for your Son, our great Savior, and for the promise of his Holy Spirit within us and, and among us to comfort us, to strengthen us, to help us and aid us every day of our lives. So, Lord, we come to you in his precious name this New Year's Day morning and ask, will you fill us with a deep consciousness of his nearness to us, that amid the raging streams of this troubled world, we should drink deeply from the life-giving, reviving stream of his grace, and so be strengthened to live for you alone, for you are reigning sovereign through all the days ahead, and so serve you to the praise of your glorious grace, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be exalted and glorified in this city and in this nation more and more until the day of his coming. So hear us, Lord, we pray in this our morning prayer, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a very, very warm welcome to you all this morning and uh, a very happy new year. Let me just uh, give you one or two notices for this morning. We don't have a, a notice sheet today. Uh, our uh, normal Sunday schools uh, are not on over this holiday period, but there is a creche for babies and toddlers uh, on the lower ground floor this morning. And the wind, that's the, uh, the cafe room just uh, off the uh, entranceway, uh, is also available. The service is being streamed down there. And uh, if parents and young children feel they'd be happier there, then uh, you're very welcome to use that. We uh, don't have our usual 6.30 evening service uh, today here in this building. Uh, we're just having one uh, service later on today, and that's at 4.30 in our Queen's Park building uh, on the south side of the, uh, of the city. So uh, if you're able to join us, do come along. If you haven't yet been in the Queen's Park building, here's a lovely opportunity for you to come and join with others uh, as we meet for a brief and uh, informal service there this afternoon at 4.30. And, uh, of course, there are, not, there are no buses and trains uh, today, so if, uh, if you need transport, uh, please do ask around after the service. Plenty of folk here with cars uh, who I'm sure will be glad to, to bring you along. Next Sunday, we're back to normal. That is, uh, we have two morning services again at 9 at Kelvin Grove and at 11 here. Uh, Paul Brenham will be preaching at those. You might like to remember Paul and Steph and the family particularly. Paul was due to be uh, preaching this morning, but they've had to go over to Northern Ireland because Steph's father uh, has, is quite seriously ill, having had a stroke and a, a brain abscess. He's had uh, two uh, operations on his uh, brain already just in this last week. And uh, so I'm sure the family will be very grateful for your prayers. Uh, next Sunday again in the afternoon, uh, Edward will be taking the service at Queen's Park at 4.30, uh, and Bob File will be preaching here uh, at 6.30 uh, in the evening and to be on holiday. I think 
Agnes, is this right? We're back to normal on Friday for uh, Activate and uh, Tron Youth. So back to school, back to fun, but Friday night will be uh, worth looking forward to uh, from five o'clock for food and then afterwards for the various activities for our young folk. Congratulations also, I can't see if you're here this morning or not, but uh, to Ross and Jenny Campbell and to Ivor, who has uh, a new little brother, Angus, who was born just, yes, you are there, I can see Ivor. Hi. Isn't that exciting? So uh, congratulations uh, very much to the Campbell family. And also congratulations uh, to Jamie Dixon and Hannah Moore, who got engaged uh, just after Christmas. So uh, that's another encouragement. Can I thank all of you who uh, contributed to the Christmas gifts for our Iranian congregation? They had a very happy party on uh, Wednesday here, and uh, there were just enough gifts for everybody to receive uh, a present, and uh, we're very grateful, and I'm sure that was a great encouragement to many of those. Do also have in your prayers the work of Hope for Glasgow. There were over 70 here for Christmas dinner last Sunday, and uh, there's going to be another dinner today for uh, many who come to Tron at 2 and are involved with that work, please be praying for Terry and the other team who are helping with him. And there is still opportunity to give to our Christmas offering, which is for Hope for Glasgow this year. Uh, you can put envelopes in the offering or put them in the, uh, the letterbox of the church office or uh, even just bring them uh, next week, and that'll be the last uh, opportunity for that. We're very delighted this morning to see uh, the Sidser family here with us, and uh, since they're here, I've grabbed Robin and asked him to come up and just uh, speak for a minute to us here, because um, we've been praying very much over recent months, uh, and indeed years, for the church, uh, Chalmers Church there in Edinburgh. You'll have to go around past this sort of wilting Christmas tree. Um, and just before, just before Christmas, welcome Robin, it's lovely to, lovely to have you here. Just before Christmas, we had the wonderful news that... Uh, your church has found a, a new building, yeah. and uh, we were rejoicing in our prayer meeting and praying about that. So since you're here, I thought I'd give you a chance to just tell us about that. Tell us about the building. Tell us about the excitement that we can, uh, we can share in with you. We're, we're so delighted to hear about it. Thank you, and uh, it, it's great to speak in many ways about this to a, a congregation that understands um, all that we've been through, um, you've been through. The building... Um, has been two and a half years in coming. We've uh, been, uh, I guess, uh, out uh, in transitional accommodation for two and a half years. And I think, whereas the church doesn't need a building, and that's true, we've uh, continued uh, without one. There comes a point where you begin to weary physically uh, with constant negotiation for some kind of extension. And I think much more than that, you begin to weary evangelistically. It's just hard to uh, reach out with the gospel without a, a building. There was um, the ideal building. Um, it wasn't for sale. Um, we had a property agent, and initially he said to us, look, you're going to really struggle to, well, it's not for sale. <laughs> and he directed us to another one, and we came very, very close to the point a year ago where we printed literature for an appeal for a building, and just on the wire, after a year of negotiations, it fell through. And then the building that we always wanted, um, there was a, a, a contact to our agent from the seller saying, look, they're prepared to consider selling you this building off-market because it's no longer... Uh, necessary for their long-term requirements. So one year later, and about a thousand meetings, and endless stalls and stalls, and Willie did tell me that, it, I mean, how long did it take you to buy Kelvin Grove? I can't remember. Ages. A long time. And then all of a sudden, we were there, and uh, just on the week before Christmas, the Tuesday before Christmas, 6.35 p.m., we got the final uh, phone call. The challenge was we had to buy it as elders. The elders had to, to effectively pay for it because uh, we had a, a non-disclosure clause on the building. But it, it's wonderful to see the congregation's huge uh, enthusiasm. Personally, for me, it's got the best set of stained glass I've ever seen, and I love stained glass. <laughs> Nobody else does, though. So, you, you, um, so you, you got the building, you had the deal done, you got the keys, and then you told the congregation. That was the first they heard of it. Well, we don't have the keys yet. <laughs> you got the promise of the keys. Technically, yeah. yeah. So the, the congregation, we'd always said to them, you'd be the first to know. 
but trust us, we have to work within the realm of confidentiality. We bought it from a university, and I think given our history and circumstances, all it took is one phone call to one newspaper, and, and we'd be done. So the congregation were wonderful. They understood that all along. And we emailed them that night and said, look, the next three days, you're going to come and see this building. And they were wonderfully encouraged um, by it. And uh, I think the elders who invested so much time in it, we haven't had any critical comments. Not that that matters, and they will come. In fact, they're starting to come now. Uh, where am I going to park my car? And, uh, but it's been wonderfully, wonderfully received with uh, thanksgiving. And um, so we're delighted about that. It's a huge encouragement, isn't it, to our congregation to hear of uh, others, not only Chalmers, but again, just the week before Christmas, to know of Holyrood and Edinburgh getting into their building. And uh, these are huge encouragements uh, to us here and to others who've been in a similar situation. It's just another sign, isn't it, that God knows what he's doing and that uh, when God is our present help and strength, uh, we really need not fear. Just tell us where the building is, Robin. Some folk might, uh, might know Edinburgh and might know. Yeah, it's in um, Morningside Road, um, just very close to Holy Corn in Edinburgh, just up from Waitrose. It's uh, a 200-year-old building. That's Sorry? handy. Handy Waitrose. Yeah, it is very nice. Um, it's a busy thoroughfare, isn't it? It is. It's a busy so it's, um, it's a busy thoroughfare, busy road, and uh, it's great to see a building opened up to the gospel. Um, so, it's a, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a church building that was being used by the university. Yeah, for many so the years. university bought it 20 years ago. It's a performing arts sort of theatre space. So if you go inside it, it looks like an old church to the outside, but inside it's a theatre um, with lighting gantries and all manner of different things. So it's a kind of old building, modern inside. And uh, it, it'll, we, we've got some challenges ahead about how we use it. We share it with them for a little while before we get in ourselves. Isn't that a lovely thing that. Um, our Kelvin Grove building, and now the Chalmers building in Edinburgh, and the Holyrood building. Three, three buildings which were once churches have been turned into something else for performing arts and are now being turned back into church buildings for the proclamation of the gospel. That is against the trend of the way things have been uh, going generally, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, that we can, we can rejoice in. Robin, just lastly, because uh, you are on holiday today, so I don't want you to be uh, feeling... You're having to work too much, but what can we pray particularly for this next few weeks? When, when do you think you'll be starting in the building, and what's, what's the, what are the key things for us yeah, to pray so for? So we, um, we told the congregation just before Christmas, which was great, but that was wonderful news to share. But then you have this kind of dip of now people have got to get their heads around. The project cost overall is, is $2.4 million. It's a lot of money, and we're asking the congregation to give, and that will be at the end of January, the pledge period and then all the transitional arrangements one of the very striking things is that we're in Pollock Halls and we keep negotiating for extensions and they gave us an extension and that runs out on the 28th of February and then the day we move into the building is the 5th of March so hopefully we can transition I think the big thing to pray for though is one of the things that's happened to our church and I guess you'll empathize with that is that when we've not had buildings or facilities or whatever, you have a very keen dependence on the Lord. Mm. And I'm really keen that we don't lose that. The building is a base and a hub to do the kind of things, God willing, that you've been able to do. And so let's please pray that, that uh, we'll be ever dependent. And please pray that they'll be happy. You know, I was trying to say to them on Christmas Day, we can be pleased because <laughs> God's, it's lovely. It's great to have a home. But uh, thank you very much. I know many of you have prayed um, weekly, monthly for this building and uh, it's a huge encouragement to feel and to know that fellowship in the gospel and we pray on very much for you guys here. Thanks Robin. Well we'll pray and uh, we'll rejoice with you as you begin that work. Lovely to have you with us here today. Well we're going to turn now to our Bibles and to uh, God's Word to read together and we're going to read Psalm 46. Uh, Somebody can shout out the page number in the church Bible. I've forgotten. Oh, it's up there, 471. Okay. So Psalm 46, to the choir master of the sons of Korah. So it's a song to be sung according to Alamoth. 
which is probably the name of the tune. It's a song. And this is the song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Behold, a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. And may God bless to us his word. We're going to sing now number 888, a great hymn by Martin Luther, which find its inspiration from this psalm, Ein Festeburg. Our God stands like a fortress rock with walls that will not fail us. Number 888.
while we have a, a few moments of quiet now as the musicians play and as our offerings for the Lord's work uh, are received. You might like to read again this psalm that we'll be studying uh, shortly together, but uh, in the quiet, our offerings will be received. Let's pray together. We're so thankful, Lord, that we come before you, a God of great faithfulness, whose mercies are new every morning, day after day, no matter what this world may bring. And Lord, as we stand on the brink of a new year, naturally our hearts are full of much uncertainty. Perhaps many of us filled with fears as we look out at the world and as we listen to the news that bombards us and hear so much that would make us tremble, that would make us shake. Another terrible terrorist attack just last night in Istanbul, many dead, many more injured. New Year's celebrations all around the world, but with vast added security to prevent suicide bombs or someone recklessly driving a lorry aiming to kill and to maim. We think, Lord, this morning very particularly of many of our mission partners around the world, some of them serving in places where there is great danger. We think this morning of Jonathan and Jewey Blythe in Istanbul, praying for them, Lord, with all that they have endured in this last year, the uncertainty of the political regime there, the constant terrorist attacks, and on top of that, for them personally, so many sadnesses of bereavement in their own family and illness among family and friends. We do lift them to you, Lord, and pray that they'd be very conscious this morning of you, the Lord, a very present help in troubled times. We think of Scott and Nock Murray, their time now drawing to a close at the River Choir Hospital in circumstances that are, are so astonishing to us. We pray for Scott and Nock for all that they have done and achieved in that place over these years that they've served there and for it to come to an end amidst ignominy and accusations must be so heartbreaking for them. We pray, Lord, for strength, for encouragement, for a clear view of the future, and for a timely opening of doors for them, that they might see clearly 
We're there to work and serve in the coming years. We remember Roy Murray Lord in South America as he travels all over that continent seeking to uh, liaise with mission organizations and uh, help mobilize mission from that continent to the vast billions of people in Southeast Asia. We pray for Roy over this Christmas and New Year period when he will be conscious of being so far away from friends and family and when his uh, solitary existence perhaps will uh, feel very lonely and distant. We pray, Lord, for friends and fellowship for him, for many encouragements in the early days of this new year. We ask for the Robray family, Lord, in Jos in Nigeria, again praying for their safety in that place which has also known terrorist bombings. We pray for the children, for Julia, she teaches them, for David and his translation work, for all that they do to bless and to encourage so many others in the missionary community there. We thank you for them, for their many talents, and ask that you would encourage and bless them throughout this coming year. We remember Imran Gill and his family in Pakistan, Lord. We thank you that thus far we've heard of no uh, awful attacks or uh, killings which so often seem to take place in that country at the times of Christian festival. We pray for safety for Imran as he travels so much with his work as the OM team leader. We pray that you be with him and encourage him and bring much fruit for their labors in Lahore and the surrounding places. Remember Sam and Ruth, Ruth Lee, Lord, living now in Chiang Mai in Thailand, praying for Sam as he travels to other countries and as he leads uh, part of the team over there. We thank you for their successful move and uh, setting up home in Chiang Mai. And we ask that you would encourage and bless them as a family and that in this year as they learn Thai and as they uh, adjust to new circumstances and a new community, that you would go with them, helping them to make friends and contacts to bless many with the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Remember Darren and Susan Wall as they also look to the future. We thank you for their work with the OMF headquarters. As they ponder perhaps a return to overseas service, we pray that you would guard and guide them in all their thinking and lead them in the path that you would have them take. And we pray very especially, Lord, for the Ferguson family in Japan and for David as he awaits the results of his latest scan following his latest round of chemotherapy. We pray, Lord, for all to be as is needed for his bone marrow transplant to take place and that his body might know full healing and strengthening, that they might be able to re-engage completely in the work that you have given them to do there in Japan. We pray for the whole family there together over this Christmas period. And we pray for Matthew as he'll return to us here in the new year and to his studies. Thanking you, Lord, for the way you have kept and sustained him and encouraged him, though being so far away at this time of his father's illness. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that is so real with these and many others part partnering with us in the gospel of Christ all around the world. What a joy it is to have bonds which cannot be sundered by time or distance with these brothers and sisters who will be our brothers and sisters forever and ever in your glorious kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for these great encouragements from the city of Edinburgh in recent weeks of this building for Chalmers Church and of the new building already being put to use uh, by Holyrood. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for these two fellowships in the time of waiting, as you've taught them faith and patience. You've encouraged them and enabled them to serve you and to see what is the real heart of ministry. We do pray, Lord, that as they become settled and have their buildings, and move from a time of waiting and transition into something of stability and settlement, that you would take away none of the urgency, none of the gospel drive and desire from their hearts, but rather increase it. Their vision may not be diminished, but widened. 
and that all that they do for you might only grow and increase throughout this year ahead. We pray likewise, Lord, for Edinburgh North Church and for our dear brother Rupert and Jan and their family also, thanking you for that new beginning in ministry, praying that in this coming year they would become established and that you would bless them richly as that church begins to find its way and looks to the future. So, Lord, for ourselves and for all who like us, partner in the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you would keep our hearts true to you every day of this coming year. Guard us and keep us, Lord, from the many lures of the prizes and the treasures of this world which so easily can encroach, can choke, and even snuff out altogether a desire, a love, a zeal for your glorious kingdom. Help us, Lord, all throughout this coming year, in our personal life, in our family life, in our church life together. Help us to be seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that all that we need, all these other things which you know that we need, that they will be added to us in abundance if our eyes are fully occupied with Christ our Savior, with his glory, with his kingdom. So, Lord, free our hearts, we pray, from freer, from anxiety, from worries about the cares of this life. And grant us, we ask, the firm foundation in our citizenship, in the kingdom which is everlasting, so that we might be a people of faith and not of fear as we face this coming year ahead. So hear us, Lord, and strengthen us now by your grace as we come to your word together. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we come to God's word, then let's sing together again. Number 894. Come, O fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing your grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, which call for songs of loudest praise. Number 894.
Well, would you turn with me to uh, the psalm we read together, Psalm 46, and uh, we're going to look at this this morning. I want to call this a song for the new year. We're on the brink of a new year, and of course, inevitably, our uh, thoughts are looking to the future. And what's in our thoughts as we think about uh, the turn of this year? Well, I suspect perhaps quite a lot of uncertainty. We do live in troubled times. We live in, in tumultuous times. Uh, it's with dread, isn't it, that you look at the uh, news headlines in the morning, especially after a big event, a big date in the calendar. And you're just looking, aren't you, for that terrorist attack. Where is it going to be? And, of course, last night it was in Istanbul. There's a lot of uncertainty in the year ahead. We've got uh, a new American president the end of January. Certainly for some people that makes them very fearful, although of course for others uh, perhaps much more positive. We've got Brexit, and the same could be said. Fearful for some, bright hopes for others. Certainly I think the media and the BBC want us to be fearful. We've got European elections coming in uh, three countries at least that I can think of, in France, in Germany and in Holland, the results of these elections could change the face of Europe and the world within the scope of the next year. We've got the ascendancy, or it seems the reascendancy of Russia on the world stage with its influence in Syria and the Middle East in general and uh, the fears that that brings to the Baltic countries, the countries of the former Soviet Union. We've got... China, increasingly belligerent in the South China Sea, and uh, the relationship between the United States of America and China looking increasingly uncertain. What is that going to bring in the coming year? We could go on and on, couldn't we? And very quickly, we could get ourselves really quite depressed. And I think we're aided in that by the instancy of the news that we have uh, all around us today. It really is quite oppressive, isn't it? Things that once upon a time would have taken days or weeks, maybe even months, to filter into our understanding, into our consciousness, now just take a few seconds. And we're bombarded with news all the time. And most of it is bad news, isn't it? And that is, I think, one of the things that's adding very much to the stress of life, particularly in the Western world. I was uh, reading an article in the newspaper a couple of days ago uh, by somebody who said that they stopped watching all news eight years ago and that their life had been much, much less stressful since. And I think that is maybe not a bad uh, New Year's resolution. Certainly a few months ago, I stopped listening to Radio 4 in the Today program in the morning and switched to Classic FM. And I can tell you that my morning is much cheerier and happier than it was previously. Somewhat less stress at the beginning of the day. There's enough stress later on in the day uh, without having it at 7 o'clock in the morning with the alarm clock. But it's easy, isn't it, to look at the new year with all of these things around us with great fear and with foreboding. And uh, it seems only natural if you do read the newspapers, listen to the news, listen to the predictions for the coming year. But friends, let me say this this morning on New Year's Day. God wants his people not to be floored by fears. He wants his people rather to be fortified by faith. He wants his people not cowering and paralyzed by the world around us, but he wants us to be courageous and purposeful in the world that we inhabit with him and for him and for his purposes. And this Psalm 46 is a song whose chorus, I think, needs to be one that we sing to ourselves and sing to one another all throughout this coming year, and indeed every year, singing it with thankfulness in our hearts to God, as Paul tells us where to sing, so that this Word of God will dwell richly in us. That's what Paul says he wants to the Colossian church, isn't it? And so that we are by doing that, constantly teaching and admonishing one another so that the peace of Christ will rule our hearts and minds, not the turbulence and the terrors of this world. 
This psalm was the inspiration for that great hymn of Martin Luther's that we sang, A Safe Stronghold is Our God. And we need to sing that loudly to ourselves and loudly to one another all through this coming year. We need to sing, verse 1, that God is our help and strength, a very present help in trouble. And therefore, we will not fear. We will not fear because the Lord of hosts is with us. And because the God of Jacob is our fortress. That's the refrain in verse 7 and in verse 11. And that is why the psalmist says in verse 5, we shall not be moved. Now that is the key recurring message of this psalm. Because God is our God, and because He is the Lord of heaven's hosts, the armies of heaven, because He is with us, we shall not fear. Now, that's the chorus. That's the assertion. But, of course, the psalm gives us good reasons to back up this assertion of faith because it's an assertion that is not based on fantasy, not on wishful thinking, but it's based on real and solid, tangible reality. There's all the difference in the world between real biblical faith and just blind fantasy. And the Bible never deals in fantasy. The Bible only deals in faith which is built on solid facts, on solid reality. And this psalm is, is utterly rooted in reality about this world. It doesn't deny it, but it is also deeply rooted in the reality about our God. And that's why its message will help us in this coming year. To be people of courageous faith, not people of cowering fear. So I want to look at the psalm with you and I want you to see that in between these assertions of faith that God is our refuge and our fortress in verses 1 and again in verses 7 and 11, in between these we have three pictures of reality that the, psalm, uh, the psalmist paints for us. And we need to see each of these pictures clearly and honestly if we're to understand how to live with real faith in a world of real fear. The psalmist Pictures first, a raging sea, and then a reviving stream, and then he gives us the picture, doesn't he, of a reigning sovereign. So first of all, look at verses 2 and 3. It pictures so vividly for us the perennial chaos of a raging sea. And the psalmist is saying, yes, we know the reality of the perils of this present world with all its storms, with all its threatenings. The roaring waters, which foam, which swell, which threaten to engulf, as he says here, even the great mountains, even the things that we think of as, as uh, immovable, as solid, as unshakable, are threatened by the raging of this world under the curse, this world adrift from its moorings in the rule of God. It's a very vivid picture, isn't it, the raging sea? It's a common one in the Bible. Now, the sea is uh, one of the Bible's common images for chaos, for, for darkness, for destruction in the world, for the forces that, that threaten mankind, that even threaten God's people, that even would seem to threaten God himself and his rule. So in Genesis chapter 1, do you remember, it was, it was out of the darkness of the great deep that God spoke and his voice brought order and beauty out of that chaos banishing the sea to form dry land, uh, dividing the waters, taming the waters. That's the picture. And yet, in a world that is under the curse of sin, the waters represent these forces of, of darkness, of chaos, of, of sorrow, of death, of grief, of all of the things that uh, so easily engulf human life in this earthly world. Flood our human lives with misery. And that's why, by the way, John's vision in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, when he has the vision of the new heavens and the earth, we're told the sea is no more. That's not a threat to people who like beach holidays. What it's saying is the chaos, the darkness, all of these forces of the raging seas, the storms that so embitter human life, they will be gone forever in the everlasting kingdom of Christ. 
There'll be an end to the very real experience of human life, which so often makes us feel that we are drowning. That's the language we use, isn't it? We say, oh, I'm battling to keep my head above water. We're talking about the stress, the anxieties, the, the, the terrors of life that we have to deal with. They will be gone. But they are all too real in our present world. And the psalmist doesn't pretend that that's not so. He says, yes, the roaring waters, they can and they do bring chaos to our human lives. Chaos personally and indeed on a global scale. And that's the picture here. It's, it's the picture of the perennial persistent chaos of the raging sea of life with all its perils, with all its pain, with all the stress, with all the sorrows, all the things that we know are all too real here on planet Earth. And it is reality, isn't it? Never mind, never mind the world situation. Many of us will have our minds full of all kinds of worries and fears, much, much closer to home as we think about the beginning of 2017. Some maybe will be worrying about their job security if the economy does dip, as some are predicting. Some young folk will be worried, won't they, about exams, exam results from exams just before Christmas or exams still to come afterwards. And what comes in the spring and the hires and uh, all of these sorts of things, university exams. For some of us, our hearts will be full of personal pain due to family issues, due to troubles with our children perhaps, or with aging parents or with stresses and strains in a marriage relationship. There's no shortage of things, are there, if we're to start thinking about them, that could fill us with fear and foreboding at the beginning of a new year. And that's why all throughout our society, all around the world, that's why people are looking for help, looking for refuge, something to strengthen them, to deal with all of these things in our lives. And often, of course, that, that refuge is sought by trying to close your eyes to reality, to run away, to escape from these painful truths into drink or into drugs or into some kind of fantasy existence online that allows you to have a different life from the life that you, you really have, to escape from what seems to be so real. That's why so many folk are motivated by self-help therapies and schemes and books. Here's a list of books that I found in a magazine recently. Here's a good one. Fear and do it anyway. You can face fear as a powerful enemy, but it will not hold you back. This astounding tape give exercises that reverse the effects of fear and allow it to be used positively. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Here's another one. End the struggle and dance with life. That promises a lot, doesn't it? This was my favorite, The Butterfly of Happiness. Has anybody read that? Happiness is like a butterfly. If you chase after it, it will always be just beyond your grasp. But if you become quiet and still, it will fly down and alight on you. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? The Bible is a book of a very different kind. It never promises things it can't deliver. It certainly never, ever encourages us to hide from reality. It doesn't give us some sort of popular therapy. No, far from being a crutch or a cave to run into, to hide from the truth about this world, as some people would want to think, the Bible teaches us to face up to reality, reality as we see all around us, not to pretend it away, but to look it firmly in the eye and see it for what it actually is, the reality of a world of perennially raging storms and seas. That is life, and we can't escape it. But the Bible also teaches us to face up to a far, far greater reality, which the gospel of Jesus Christ alone can open our eyes to so that we can see with real clarity and with real perspective everything about this world. Because the Bible teaches us that towering over the undeniable reality of the raging sea 
in this world is the unseen, undeniable reality of a reigning sovereign, of a God who rules time and eternity. And that's the picture at the end of the psalm, if you look at verses 8 to 10. It pictures very clearly for us, doesn't it, doesn't it the permanent conquest of a reigning sovereign. Because, you see, we know the reality of the promise of the future. Look at verse 8. Behold, look, see human history from the perspective of eternity. That's what God's revelation in his word gives to us. It gives us eyes to see not less reality, but more reality. And the reality is that this God, our God, is the Lord of the hosts of heaven, and he towers over all earthly powers, verse 9. He makes wars to cease to the very ends of the earth. This God has vindicated himself all through history. The psalmist can testify to that over all his enemies, verse 8, bringing destruction. Think of the Egyptians chasing the Israelites to the brink of the Red Sea. And they were the ones plunged into its furious depths. Think of all Israel's enemies from Joshua's day onwards, all through their history. And the psalmist says this God will likewise vindicate himself to the very ends of the earth. Not, by the way, as some sort of peace negotiator for the United Nations. Not by compromising with terrorists. Not by trading land for peace or anything like that. Now, he will assert his peace as a result of total victory, permanent conquest over all of his foes. Verse 9, he makes wars to cease to the very ends of the earth, and he does that by outright victory. He breaks the weapons of his enemies. He burns their chariots, their, their symbols of, of power. He burns them with fire, makes them as nothing. His firepower, you might say, is absolutely invincible. And that is because it is the power of the Lord of hosts. And verse 10 says, his voice simply says to the world, be quiet, be silenced, and know that I am God. I am the one with power over you. Over everything that you say, everything that you do, and it will be me not you, who is exalted all over the earth. God will bring peace because he brings at last to judgment every foe and every force that stands against him. Now, we like to think of the God of peace, don't we? We like to talk and sing of the Prince of Peace, especially at Christmas time. We don't like quite so much to think of God as the conquering warrior. But even in Isaiah's great prophecy about the Prince of Peace there in Isaiah chapter 9, it is there. He will be the Prince of Peace. Why? Because he is also the wonderful, that is the awe-inducing counselor. That is in the council of war. He's the mighty God. It means he's a mighty warrior. He's the everlasting. He's the indestructible father. That is the great leader of his people who leads them out against the enemies. That's why Isaiah says in the very next verse there that he will be like a warrior trampling underfoot his enemies, burning them like fire. That is how he will be the Prince of Peace. That's the hope that the gospel of Jesus Christ promises. Peace through God's great judgment on all enemies, on all evil, on all darkness. We saw it, didn't we, in our Christmas studies on Malachi. His coming will be a fire to set ablaze all enemies. And it's the gospel that Jesus himself commanded that his apostles went out and preached to all the world. Peter tells us that himself in Acts chapter 10. Jesus commanded us, he says, to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness. And the great longing of the New Testament hope, therefore, is for that final victory at last to be revealed. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come and judge the world in righteousness. 
make all wars at last to cease. Now, what a great hope that is, friends, to know this eternal reality and therefore to be able to face all earthly reality that would otherwise floor us and fill us with fear. To know that one day he will come, he will make all wars to cease. Just think about that. All wars. All the wars within. All the battles that you face so incessantly, so constantly against sin. All the urges. All the great battles of your life will cease. Because we have a reigning sovereign. And his permanent conquest will at last be seen, will be asserted all throughout his kingdom. That'll be when we receive our final salvation. That's what our hope is. So don't despair. All those wars within will cease. And don't fear because all wars without will cease likewise. We don't need to fear any power in this whole world that sets itself against Christ and his everlasting kingdom. He will be exalted among all the nations. Verse 10, even among all enemies, all mockers, all haters of Christ and his church, in the end, willingly or unwillingly, will exalt our Lord Jesus Christ. Every militant Islamist, every scornful politician, every snide and cynical journalist, every TV pundit, every hostile power will bow low and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. So when they're raging, so often seems to be causing the world as we know it and all that we hold precious to, to quake, to crumble, to fall away, we need not fear. We must not fear. Nor do we need to compromise to try and broker some sort of uneasy peace with the hostile forces of this world against the gospel. No. We know the reality of a future that is promised by our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are not to be those who surrender to the thinking of this world. Rather, we are to be those who call this world to surrender to the sovereign who has conquered through his great victory over death and the grave. We are to call this world to bow the knee now while there is still time before at last every person in this world stands before his judgment seat and will be bowed low, willingly or unwillingly. The Christian gospel is not a hopeless pleading from a hostile world to, to please give Jesus the time of day. Please consider. Please be a bit more generous in your thinking about Jesus and his church. No, no, no. The Christian gospel is a command from an all-conquering sovereign. He calls all men everywhere to repent, says the Apostle Paul, to the wisdom and the aristocracy of Athens. The times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now... In raising Jesus from the dead, he has made clear to all flesh. And you must buy a liar before him. Because, verse 9, do not forget, he burns with fire every chariot of man that is arrayed against him. So we offer peace in the gospel. Of course we do. We offer mercy. We offer grace in abundance. But we must never, ever do so forgetting that we do so as ambassadors of a reigning sovereign. And you see, friends, it's when our eyes are open to that much greater truth about a reigning sovereign that even the raging waters of this world are transformed, and they're transformed into reviving streams. That's a picture in verses 4 to 6. It describes the present comfort of a reviving stream. Look at the sudden change in tone from verse 3 to verse 4. The roaring waters suddenly become reviving waters. A river to gladden our hearts, not scaring us, not submerging us, but serving us, 
sustaining us. Because we know the reality of God's presence with us. The beginning of verse 4, there's actually no uh, word there is, uh, as it is in our translation. It's just abruptly, a river. And the implication is that these same waters, these raging waters, the realities of life in a, in a fallen world, in a hostile world, when seen through eyes that are opened by faith in the truth of the gospel, with the ultimate perspective of eternity, these same waters are actually seen to be quite, quite different. It's not that the hostile forces, the enemy forces disappear. But it is that God's voice and God's command of power utterly outranks theirs, verse 6. He utters his voice and the earth melts and their kingdoms totter. There's a lovely play on words there. It's the same word translated moved uh, in verse 2. The mountains are moved into the sea and the and, uh, same word here in verse 6, totter. And it's the same word in verse 5 about us not being moved. You could probably uh, translate all of them as shaken. The roar of, of evil and opposition to God in this world seems to shake the very foundations of everything and even the foundations of faith. But no, God opens his mouth and all opposition is shaken to the core. It melts away and therefore, verse 5, because God is in the midst of his people, we will never be shaken. In fact, the raging of these stormy waters in God's controlling hand, in His gracious providence, instead they become for us not raging, but they bring us, verse 4, rejoicing, making us glad. They bring us, verse 5, resilience, we shall not be moved. And verse 10, they bring us rest, they bring us the stillness and the deep peace of knowing that our God will be exalted and that therefore we, his people, shall share in his exalted glory. The waters which seem to rage are actually reviving. And leading us to rejoicing. That's a great biblical principle, isn't it? All through the scriptures. Joseph, in Genesis chapter 50, put it this way. What man meant for evil, God intended for good, for the saving of many lives. Or Paul, in Romans 8, puts it this way. All things, that is, all the present groanings he's speaking about, the groanings of life in a still fallen world full of, of raging and roaring and threatenings, all these things, he says, the very things that seem to oppose us, all these things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That is, for those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, his roar overwhelms and silences even the greatest roaring of this world against those who call upon God, the God of Jacob. We have a reigning sovereign. And he turns all the raging waters that we will ever face in this life. He turns them into reviving streams that will not only rejoice our hearts now, but are actually refining our souls testing our faith so that our faith will be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's how Peter puts it, isn't it, in the first chapter of his letter. And James says the same things. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of all kinds, when you meet the perennial raging seas of life. Count it all joy because it is working in you the very crown of life. See these things for what they really are. They are the reviving streams of God that can't possibly harm your life, but will certainly, if you see these things through the eyes of humble faith, will hone your life in God's good hand, shaping you into the person he has called you to be for all eternity. Even the terrors, the trials, the tragedies, the tears of a frightening world. When you view them with 
eyes that see the triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will for us work tenacity and triumph in our faith. They will work in us the faith that can never be shaken. But only if we do believe and trust God, only if we do view life from His perspective, not just from our own, even if, only if we really do trust that He is with us, that He's not against us, that He's not absent from us when it may seem that all the raging and the roaring of the waters round about us are signs of His absence and His abandonment of us. That's why all through the psalm is that refrain, God is with us. He's in the midst of us. He is a very present help. Because it can be so hard to see that. It can be so hard to think that, can't it? When you're in the midst of darkness and trials, when your mind is flooded with fears and anxieties, when all of that surrounds you, you feel, God must have abandoned me. God must have deserted us. Just as it surely seemed to all the world that God could not possibly be with the Lord Jesus Christ as a naked man beaten and flogged and hanging upon a cross in the face of all scorn and mockery and deep shame. But God was there with him in Christ himself. He was reconciling the world to himself. Crucified at the hand of wicked men, yes, said the apostle Peter, absolutely, but doing only what God's sovereign power and will had purposed. To bring not the raging of his judgment, but the reviving, redeeming stream of God's forgiveness to us so that we might be his forever, his people, his children. And so what was a place of, of bitterness and hatred and shame and scorn became the place of beauty and honor to those who gladly receive his gift, who, who trust in his mercy. And friends, that division, two completely different ways of seeing reality, it's also there in the way that we look at, at the ebb and flow, at the tides and, and the currents of all that we will face in our lives in this coming year of 2017 and throughout all of our lives. If we see only the raging seas, then these things will very likely just fill us with fear. And the things that happen to us and surround us may well fill us only with bitterness in our lives. But if we see it in the light of our reigning sovereign, then instead of fear, we'll find faith. And instead of a, a legacy of bitterness in our souls for what's been done to us, we'll find a growing beauty in our spirit as we long for the fullness of what God is working in us through all these things by which he is making us into more than conquerors through him who loved us. So which way are we going to look and see the waters of 2017? Let's help one another throughout this coming year to remember that we have a reigning sovereign, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven, and that he is willing to stick with us, even as he stuck with that twisted Jacob. Isn't that, isn't that such a wonderful comfort that he who could stick with a man like Jacob, well, surely he can stick with someone like me. We have a reigning sovereign. And so in his hands, even the wildest raging seas we face, they will be seen, certainly, ultimately, to be nothing other than reviving streams. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, which should call forth from us songs of loudest praise. That's what it means to belong to the household of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is in the midst of us. We shall not be moved. God will help us when the morning dawns. 
The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Let's pray. O oh God, merciful Father, who despises not the sighing of a contrite heart, nor the desire of such as be sorrowful, mercifully assist our prayers which we make before Thee in all our troubles and adversities, whensoever they oppress us, and graciously hear us, that those evils which the craft and subtlety of the devil or man work against us be brought to naught, and by the providence of thy goodness they may be dispersed, that we, thy servants, being hurt by no persecutions, may evermore give thanks unto thee in thy holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to sing as we close uh, this morning a hymn by another great one, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, number 236. By gracious powers so wonderfully sheltered and confidently waiting, come what may, we know that God is with us night and morning and never fails to meet us each new day. Number 236.
And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you until the end of the age. Amen.